welcome to the City Club of Portland Friday Forum. City Club is where we bring civic-minded people together to make Portland and Oregon a better place for everyone to live, work, and play. I'm Karen Curvin, president of City Club. I would like to welcome members and guests alike, those, those of you who join us today at Sentinel Hotel, and those of you listening on OPB radio or watching on Portland community media. The generous support of City Club's corporate and media partners ensure we put on the state's best civic programs week after week. I'd like to thank our media partner, Oregon Business Magazine. Our current Friday Forum sponsors are Echo Northwest, Chevron, Girding Edlin, Morel Inc., Northwest Natural, and Schwabi, Williamson, and Wyatt. We are grateful for your support and commitment to City Club's mission. Please join me in a warm round of applause for all of them. City Club is where people who love Portland work together to help solve our biggest problems. Now is your chance to love Portland back. If you're already a member of City Club, help others get involved. If you join or renew between now and May 31st, two days from now, you will save $25. You can join after the program. Just be sure to connect with a City Club staff person or you can join online at www.pdxcityclub.org slash join. Next week, we will hold our annual meeting to vote on a slate of candidates for the Board of Governors, including officers of the board. We have two nominations for president-elect, Courtney Nelson and Eric Zimmerman. A paper ballot for the position of president-elect will be collected from each city club member following short statements by each candidate. We urge all city club members to attend this important annual meeting. Doors open at 11.15, and the meeting will begin at 11.30. We will hold our regularly scheduled Friday Forum, The Corporate Tax Illusion, with Floyd Norris of the New York Times beginning at 12.15 p.m. We are hosting three after-hours events next week. On Monday, our new Leaders Collective is hosting a Leader Spotlight with Susan Anderson, the director of Portland's Bureau of Planning and Sustainability. On Wednesday, we will have a civic workshop that will give you the tools to identify the right grant for your organization. And later that evening at Kells, a discussion on reducing sex offense recidivism. You can learn more about City Club events, purchase tickets, and become a member on our website, pdxcityclub.org. And as always, we will be live tweeting today's program. You can follow along and join the conversation using the hashtag PDXCityClub. After our program today, Ozan Verol will facilitate a Q&A session with David McGraw. Members, please come to the microphone to ask your question. For all of our audience members, please locate the index cards on the center of your tables and write your question on them during the forum. Hold your cards up high and City Club staff will collect them prior to the start of Q&A. And now for our program. Following the attacks against cartoonists in Paris and Denmark, there has been a renewed discussion about the line between protected free expression and hate speech that targets disempowered populations. As a pluralistic society, how do we ensure that we vigorously defend the right to freedom of the press while also ensuring that our most vulnerable communities are not victimized by bigotry. Today we will look inside one of the country's most venerable newsrooms where those issues are front and center every day. David McGraw is the Assistant General Counsel and Vice President of the New York Times and Ozan Verol is a professor of comparative constitutional and Islamic law at Lewis and Clark Law School. Please join me in welcoming today's guest to Friday Forum. Okay, thank you everyone. Um, so David, I'd like to begin with some inside baseball, if that's okay. 
Uh, if you could please take us back to January 2015 when two brothers stormed the offices of Charlie Hebdo in France and brutally machine gunned 12 people to their death in response to the publication of cartoons depicting the Prophet Muhammad um, in, in the, uh, the, the Charlie Hebdo newspaper. Now, following that tragedy, the New York Times decided not to republish the, uh, the Muhammad cartoons that originally ran in Charlie Hebdo. The Times also did not run the now uh, famous cover of Charlie Hebdo, which was published after the tragedy that depicts a tearful prophet Muhammad holding a, a slogan or a sign, and I'll attempt my best French pronunciation here, Je suis Charlie, um, or I am Charlie. Um, and and uh, so some argue that the, that the cartoons, particularly that last one, have some news value and should be published as a uh, tribute to free speech and to show solidarity with, um, with Charlie, Charlie Hebdo. So the iconic slogan of the New York Times is all the news that's fit to print. So why did the New York Times decide that this particular bit of news, uh, specifically the cartoons, were not fit to print? Thank you, and, and thank you for showing up today. Uh, let, let me start with a disclaimer um, that I really love Portland, but I do want to be able to go back to my, uh, to my job in New York, so I'm going to be very careful about what I say about the New York Times. Uh, the, uh, uh, and, but fortunately, I'm going to be channeling uh, the, the decision that our editor, Dean Beck Hay, made, and a decision that, uh, that uh, I think was right not to, not to run the cartoons. Um, the interesting thing and for us, maybe the sad thing for you, of course, is that I, I think that uh, Ozan and I agree that it's not really a legal issue in the United States. And so here you are being treated to having two lawyers talk about an ethical decision. It's a little bit like having a vegetarian review a steakhouse. But OK, if that's what you want, that's what we'll do. <clears throat> so uh, sorry to the lawyers in the house. Uh, the decision that day was, as, as our editor, Dean Banquet, has, has made clear in a couple of interviews he's done with Der Spiegel and elsewhere, was really driven not by a concern about security and not any sort of concern about whether there be uh, retribution from ISIS or jihadists or anything else. It was really driven by a sense that balancing sensitivity and news judgment, that the cartoons didn't really rise to the level where they were necessary from a news value to uh, offset whatever offense they might be caused. I, and I'm going to read for, uh, from an interview that Dean did. Um, it says, I think there are ways to defend the right to publish while holding on to your standards. As much as I love showing solidarity, that's my second or third most important job. My first most important job is to serve the readers of the New York Times. And a big chunk of the readers of the New York Times are people who would be offended by showing satire of the Prophet Muhammad. That reader is not a member of Islamic State. That reader is a guy who lives in Brooklyn and is Islamic and has a family and is devout and just happens to find that insulting. We would make a big mistake journalistically if we forgot those readers. And he goes on from there talking about how, in his view, we could tell this story without actually showing the cartoons. And as I said, that's a decision that, in my own mind, I, I, I easily defend. Tough decision, as he says, but I think it was the right one. Right. Um, and if I can underscore, highlight uh, a point in, in David's answer there, I'm, I'm originally from Istanbul, Turkey, which is 99% Muslim, but it's also a secular country constitutionally and, and legally. And all of the Turks that I spoke with um, wholeheartedly condemned the attacks, but I were, they were also deeply offended by the depiction of the Prophet Muhammad in, in cartoons or really any, any sort of... Um, Sort of forum. So you certainly run the risk of alienating modern Muslims by uh, putting the imprimatur of the New York Times on, on the cartoons themselves. I'm also curious: Were you able to talk to your reporters in the sort of the, the in Muslim countries and and how they reacted to to the controversy? You, you know, this is going to be really boring if you and I agree. <laughs> so, so we're I'll try to, to disagree. All right. Okay. Well, well sounds good. Yeah, because we're probably the, the only two people in the room who agree with this position. So, so we'll try to win some people over today. That will be our goal. Um, yeah. I mean, the, the the way this unfolded was that that there was a group of editors who were meeting, discussing this, and talking to people in the newsroom of various faiths, including including Muslims, about you know what what should we do here and. 
my role, as, as I said, this, this was not a legal call. There is not a, a speech, even if it were to rise to the level of hate speech, and we can talk about what that is, is not prohibited in the United States. Uh, the First Amendment is vibrant and robust and protects us. And I actually became part of the discussion in a, a separate role I, I play, which is that I am one of the key players in our security operations around the world. And so if we were going to have to raise the alert, if you will, for our security uh, team uh, at various bureaus in dangerous places, I needed to know about that. I'll come back to that in a second because that, that's, that's important. Uh, one of the things that um, uh, we did, though, was we talked to our people who are in uh, uh, primarily Islamic countries, and none of our correspondents expressed any fear whatsoever. What they did express was that the, the Muslims that they dealt with regularly in their reporting, moderate people in responsible positions, wouldn't understand the decision. And the one thing they said was, if you decide to, to um, run the cartoons, you should be sure and explain your reasoning, because that will be important in the scheme of things. Uh, th there has been, in the aftermath of this, and, and I think back to those conversations, in the aftermath of this, there's been a, a lot of discussion of that it was you know, done out of fear. And, and the simple answer to that is, is simply, that's just not so. That we, you know, every day, we are at risk. Our reporters are at risk by where they are. There rarely is a, a week that passes where there isn't sometimes where we hear that someone is being threatened with kidnapping or violence or whatever it is. We believe that the way we stand up for free speech is not by necessarily running these cartoons, but by being in those places so people like you can get the story. We think we can do that safely, but it's not without risk. And it's those risks that we take on, whether we're um, in Syria, Egypt, uh, Afghanistan, wherever it may be, Ukraine. Uh, the, the thing that, one of the things that, that I'd underscore here is that Dean's decision was actually um, the, in line with a very long history at the New York Times. And I raise this when anybody brings up the question of, well, you know, uh, you, were, you know, it was done out of fear. Uh, the New York Times uh, apologized in 1974 for running a picture that depicted Muhammad. Uh, you can look it up. And uh, I remember 1974. Uh, I did, wasn't really worried about jihad. Nixon concerned me, but, but jihad not so much, okay? Um, and so this had been the tradition that going back into the 50s um, and, and carrying on, we didn't run the Danish cartoons when Dean's predecessor, um, Bill Keller, was, was in charge of the newsroom. Again, not, not a legal decision, but a decision balancing the news value of publishing with the, uh, the likelihood that it may offend people. Yeah, I think it's really interesting that, the, that your reporters were more concerned about alienating uh, their modern Muslim sources as opposed to fearing any sort of retaliation from, from extremists. And if we can just take a step back, I'll briefly explain why depictions of the Prophet are considered offensive from an Islamic law perspective. Um, now, there's nothing in the Quran that says, thou shalt not draw cartoons of Muhammad. Um, at the same time, though, the Quran does say there is no God but God. In other words, there's a single God. Muslims don't believe in the Holy Trinity. Um, and they also don't believe in idol worship. Idol worship is prohibited by, by the Quran as well. And Muhammad himself spoke out against his own portrayal in images when he was alive, saying that, I, you know, if, if that happens, then people are going to start worshiping me as opposed to, to God himself. And he said, I'm, I'm just a man. So if you walk into a mosque, you'll see beautiful calligraphy, uh, but there are no images in the mosque. And that's related to that, to that ban on... Um, ban on idol, idol worship. Uh, now some branches of Islam actually disagree with that interpretation. Uh, so you'll see some images in especially Shia uh, mosques. But regardless of whether or not Islamic law actually prohibits the depiction of the Prophet Muhammad, many Muslims, certainly the vast majority of the Muslims, find the depictions to be blasphemous and, um, and deeply offensive. So since David asked me to push back a little bit, so I'll start doing that now. I was going to push back against you. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. Then we can have a little tug of war here. Um, so the very, the very role of satire, right, is to push boundaries and challenge everything, even the, the sacred. Um, and Charlie Hebdo is a 
deliberately offensive magazine, and they take shots at all social and religious groups, including both spectrums of, uh, uh, of politicians as well, both the political left and the political right. And the magazine belongs to sort of a unique, provocative, Parisian brand of, of humor. If I remember correctly, I mean, they, they had a cartoon published where they depicted the, uh, the, the, uh, the father, the son, and, and the Holy Spirit in a sexual threesome. So there's an argument to be made that the, that, the, that the magazine is sort of an equal opportunity offender, so to speak. Um, what do you think about that? Well, you've noticed I haven't tried to speak French, so that has to be the first tip off. Of I, I don't know a lot about Charlie Hebdo, and, and how he does. I've learned more than I'd want to. And th there's no question that, that uh, it was anti-establishment religions, whatever their flavor. Uh, uh, Le Monde went and did a, a study and found that there were seven front pages that uh, took on Muslims, there were 21 that took on Christians, there were 10 that took on Jews. So you sort of see this, this equal opportunity uh, assault on, on that. And you know, again, I think that, that in the United States, that speech is protected and should be protected. I and mean, we have drawn the balance in a very different way than, than, than they do in Europe. Uh, in the aftermath of, of Charlie Hebdo, of course, there were uh, many uh, uh, Muslims who were then charged with hate speech for uh, supporting the terrorists or otherwise uh, making statements that seem to uh, uh, be in favor of the jihadists. That's not a step we would take and we don't kind of understand free speech to work that way. Um, if I could just kind of bounce off that, I mean one of the things that, that, that I think is hard whenever we talk about protecting free speech, and, and now this is going to be David McCraw, not the New York Times talking, is that you know, the, the real essence of protecting free speech is, is, is protecting speech you disagree with, not speech that you happen to agree with. And that's one of the things I think that, that troubles people about um, the reaction afterwards. I think that if you look at the, the three million people that turned out in Paris after the attack, it was really a, a moving event, and, but it, to me it wasn't so much an embrace of free speech, it was an embrace of not being terrified, of standing up to terrorism, those are good things, but they're different from being in favor of free speech. I mean, if you sort of think about it, the example I asked people was, picture this, imagine that there's skinheads who are taunting making fun of and have offensive billboards and posters and pictures of recent African immigrants in Paris. And let's assume the recent African immigrants finally have had enough of it, enough of this racial, uh, this racist, racist talk, and so they firebomb the, the, the skinhead's clubhouse or office and people die. Would three million people be saying, je suis skinhead? You know, we, you know, but that's really the test of free speech is, is that we, we stand for uh, the right to speak even when we disagree with it. It also, I think, underscores why I think in, in trying to decide whether to, um, to run the cartoons, you ask yourself, or, or I think you look at it, is it's, we can embrace the principle without embracing the speech. As The Guardian said in its editorial, and The Guardian also decided not to run the cartoons, is that we can stand for free speech and we can stand for people's right to say things without being forced to say them ourselves. And that's kind of the essence of free speech. I think the, the scenario you described uh, played out somewhat differently, of course, in, in the United States, but the ACLU famously defended the rights of a neo-Nazi group to march through, uh, this was in the 1970s, to march through Skokie, Illinois, which is a fairly significant um, Jewish population, but in defending the rights of that, the, the First Amendment rights of that neo-Nazi group, the ACLU certainly wasn't um, embracing the, the message, the extremist message that they were, um, that they were, they, that they were spreading. So it's possible to acknowledge um, that offensive speech or speech that you disagree with, as you put it, should be protected without necessarily embracing the content of, of the speech. Right, and, and, it's, and it's, it, let's face it, it's very hard for a publication like the New York Times to be consistent in these judgments, different factors, different years, different editors, and so forth. We try to be, but, but, it, but it's hard, and, and people were showing, well, you know, you showed this, por this painting, this portrait, you uh, you know, weren't sensitive to the feelings of this group when you did this and so forth. F fair, fair 
uh, criticism. These are tough decisions, and these are decisions that get made by people uh, just like yourself. And if you sort of think about the, whether it's at work or with your family, being consistent is one of the things we strive for, but you know, sometimes we fail at. But uh, it, it, it is interesting, to, in, in the aftermath of this, people approaching me and you know, suggesting how we should go about it and why we should run them and so forth and so on. And you know, it, it, these kind of decisions get made in a lot of different contexts. In terms of, the, say, the beheading, the terrible beheading of, of, of the uh, American kidnap victims in Syria, a good question, should you show those videos? A lot of people are going to be offended by that. And a lot of people are going to say, you don't really understand what ISIS is about until you actually see that. And those kind of decisions get made all the time. And I think that, 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 that getting that balance right is hard, but it's unavoidable. Somebody has to make that, that decision. And, and again, you, you sort of look and say, can you tell that story? Can you tell that story in a way that's meaningful to your readers without also offending whatever segment of your readership uh, may be offended. Sometimes you, sometimes you can't. Sometimes you actually need to see it. I can envision where if there were subtleties in the cartoons or there were th specific things that were at issue, you'd need to show them. But I think a lot of times you can tell that story without risking the offense. I think one of the reasons, too, why the, the New York Times became the subject of, of intense criticism over this issue is, and, and why the assassination of the Charlie Hebdo employees struck such a chord in the United States is um, in part because freedom of speech is one of our most prized constitutional um, values, and the, the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution is considered um, exceptional. In, in many ways. So I wonder if you can speak to that a little bit as a, as a First Amendment attorney. You actually want me to ask something I know something about. That's good. <laughs> okay, this is good. Um, the, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, what, I think that the argument that gets made, the argument I get here, that I hear when I've gone around and spoken about this and talked about it at Bar Association and so forth is, uh, and it was actually the very question that Der Spiegel asked Dean Backhey when Der Spiegel interviewed him about this, which is, shouldn't you show solidarity? And over and over again, that's what was being said, was shouldn't you show solidarity? And that's, what our, that's the position our public editor took. She works as the ombudsperson, if you will, for the, for the newspaper. She's there to represent the views of readers and to raise hard questions, and she did. Shouldn't you show solidarity? And Dean Backhey in the interview says, that's not really my job as an editor to show solidarity, even when it's an issue I believe in deeply and even when it's the right thing. And as a reader, if I could speak from that standpoint, you know, when the United States decides to send troops someplace, I don't want to read a newspaper that displays a series of American flags and gives the rah-rah to show solidarity with the, with the American people. In fact, even if 99% of the people think it's right, in fact, because 99% of the people think it's right, I want a newspaper that's going to be asking hard questions and reporting on it. And, and, and that, to me, is really the, the, the role, different from the editorial page, but the role of the newspaper is to not be taking sides, even when the sides are really worthwhile, but doing what, as Dean says, going out and, as he puts it to the Der Spiegel, covering the hell out of the story. I don't know how that translates into German, but that's what, what he says. So, and I agree with that completely. And, and related to the point about um, sort of not taking sides on the issue, too, I think one of the points that got lost in deba debates about Charlie Hebdo, I thought, was I think a lot of people took the, the position that you either embrace both the legality and content of the cartoons, and therefore you're for free speech, or you reject the content or you criticize the content, and therefore you're against free speech. But as David put it, I mean, I think it's possible to disaggregate the two and stand firmly for free speech, but at the same time also acknowledge that the content of the cartoons was, um, was offensive. Right, I mean, what The Guardian says in its editorial is, is put another way, Defending the right of someone to say whatever they like does not oblige you to repeat their words. And, and that, that to me is, is sort of the abstract principle that, that is worth defending. Um, and you know, people obviously struggled with this, and, and I understand people who go the other direction. I understand why people thought it was important, and I, and I know a lot of people who thought 
that you needed to show the cartoon not as a matter of solidarity, but as a matter of telling the, the news story. I don't see it that way, but I certainly understand those things. Um, and you know, the, one of the things that, that in talking to people about this that, that I've come back to is that many times when people are really revved up about how wrong it was not to run the cartoons, I will say, what do your Muslim friends think about it? That's a very interesting opinion, but what do your Muslim friends think about it? And it's amazing how many people need to look at the top of their shoes at that moment. <laughs> and, and you start to realize that a lot of us, me included, don't really have that many Muslim friends whose opinion we could gather, not as a veto and not to put them on the spot, but just trying to understand it. If I'm about to say something uh, that's offensive to women, you know, I would try to ask women, you know, is, it, you know, is this, is this did I cross a line here? What's this about? Not because their opinion should dictate, but because their opinion should be part of that, that fertile decision-making process. And then that's one of the things that, that happened at the Times, which I thought was really valuable, was try to understand this from a, from a variety of, of viewpoints. And related to David's important point about sort of asking what Muslims think about the issue, too, is to, to also think about what Muslims in France, uh, to think about, the, think about the issue and situate the cartoons. And I think the the unique context of, of France as well. France has a pretty disturbing colonial history. They have their own uh, conception of secularism that they call laicite, which is a fairly strict version of secularism. And they also have a large, substantial, uh, yet marginalized and vulnerable um, Muslim population. And that population, I think, believes that they're often marginalized under liberal principles like secularism, which some of them at least argue serve as a window dressing for discrimination. And David already alluded to this in one of his earlier answers, but one prominent example of this is the ban on the, uh, the covering of the face in public places. So that went into effect in 2011. So in France, you can't um, appear in public wearing anything that covers your face. And that, that is pretty specifically or pretty clearly, I think, targeted at the, the, the Muslim uh, burqa. And if you violate the ban, you have to pay a fine. And on top of that, you have to undergo what they call citizenship education. Um, so. I find it a little ironic that France is okay when it comes to, um, or okay with free expression when it comes to blasphemy, but not as okay with it when expression takes the form of appear in public uh, with, uh, with Islamic clothing. So I think the cartoons take on a different color in the context of France. I think the cartoons might be provocative political messages from the perspective of a Western audience, but from the Muslim, the minority Muslim population in France, I think many of them see it as, as bullying and, and victimizing in some sense. This may be where we're going to start <laughs> parting company. I, I, I think absolutely Charlie Hebdo should have the right to publish the cartoons. And that's very American of me. I, I, I certainly don't have a European point of view of that on that. Um, and there was much criticism, or there started to be this criticism about Charlie Hebdo punching down that is that it's wrong to um, attack the vulnerable as opposed to the powerful. Gary Trudeau, the uh, cartoonist from Doonesbury, uh, wrote in great eloquence about this that the great tradition of satire has been punching up. And you know, the satires, like himself, take on the powerful. Uh, they, they, they don't take on the weak. Okay, I, I mean, I think that's probably true, and I think that's probably been the real power of, of satire. But I don't think that it's 100% all the time like that. If satirists want to take on the Westboro Baptist Church, you remember those people who stand outside soldiers' funerals to bring their uh, uh, anti-gay rights message, uh, I'm all for that. <laughs> I, hope, I hope they're a minority, and I hope cartoonists are punching down that day. Uh, because they, they really should be taken on. So, uh, again, from a, and I'm, I'm, you're not asking me from a legal standpoint, I, although that's how I answered it because I'm a lawyer. Right. No, from a legal perspective, too, I, I also believe that Charlie Hebdo has all, every right in the world to, to publish the cartoons that it did. Uh, so I was trying to ask a slightly different question, not with regard to the legality, but about what to do when free speech and free press, which... Uh, I assume all of us in this room have a firm commitment to targets vulnerable populations in a particular country. In other words, how do you ensure that you can defend free speech and free press 
while also trying to make sure that vulnerable and marginalized minorities in the country are not bullied and victimized by that speech. Well, I knew that your question. I was trying to avoid it, and I really resent the fact that you're going to make me answer it. Uh, <laughs> talking about being bullied um, and vulnerable. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the answer is, uh, to me, and I'm going to give that cliched answer, right, which is more speech. Uh, the, the American answer to that is that we should have more voices and that we should be protecting free speech, we should be encouraging uh, a, a robust marketplace of ideas. And as much as the internet has created a heartache for those of us in traditional media, I know you came with your iPad, I, I'm an old school guy, I came with paper, uh, that you know, they, making it harder and harder for, for newspapers, the traditional newspapers to survive. The internet is a really powerful tool for democratizing the marketplace. It, it, it allows people to, who would not be heard to be heard and I think that's a really, really great thing. Now, a lot of those voices are a little bit too hate-filled <laughs> and a little bit too uninformed, maybe, but that's okay. That's kind of the, the price we pay. But So I, I am hopeful that uh, for people who are marginalized, for people who, whose voices aren't being heard, that there, there is an opportunity through technology to be heard because at the end of the day, I'm just not comfortable with government stepping in as is more of the European model they have free speech in Europe, but there's more of a European, in Europe the model is that we should try to protect um, those who are, um, uh, who, who are, are vulnerable and, and from hate speech and other things. My view, my hope is, is that uh, the marketplace can do that. I just don't trust governments to come in and make the right decision and to do that fairly and to create some sort of perfect level of speech. Well, certainly, the, I think the model we have in the United States is, is the right one, although I, I will mention just as a side that the model is deteriorating to some extent. We now have a massive surveillance state and really aggressive prosecutions of, of leakers of information, not just the leakers themselves, but also, also reporters as well. So the, the exceptional First Amendment that we have uh, doesn't look as exceptional as it once did, perhaps. But no, I absolutely agree with David. I think once once you start drawing lines about you know, offensive versus non-offensive speech or hateful versus non-hateful speech from a legal perspective, then you're allowing the government to make those decisions which, how to categorize speech, which can be quite dangerous because what's offensive to, to David might be funny to me. Um, and we often tend to call speech that we disagree with offensive as well. And that sort of certainly opens the door to, to censorship and regulation of, of speech. Right, and I, and I think that's, that's where we've put our marker down as Americans, that, um, you, you know, places like Sweden, it's robust free speech, free press, and, and, and elsewhere in Europe, but they, they take a very different view of this, and are at least at crucial moments they take a different view of this. Um, and I, I still believe our system really works well in, in allowing people the freedom uh, and in deciding that while more regulation may actually create some social value, that that's too high price to pay because of the risk associated with it. Of course. I'd like to switch gears a little bit and call attention to just a very recent controversy involving uh, Penn. So for those in the audience who don't know, International Penn is a worldwide association of writers and free thinkers, and American Penn is a, a, a branch of it. At the, the, just the literary gala that happened this month, earlier this month, um, Penn awarded the Goodale Freedom of Expression Courage Award to Charlie Hebdo, and that decision caused some controversy, and um, six prominent authors actually withdrew from, from the gala. So I wonder, David, if you can chime in on the, on the controversy and, and share your thoughts on it. So in a, in a nutshell, for those of you who didn't follow this, or fortunate enough not to follow this as closely as I had to, uh, the PEN America, great organization, great international organization, uh, defending the right of authors and, and others to, to have free expression, decided to give their annual award at the annual banquet to, um, uh, to Charlie Hebdo, and there were, in fact, many, many authors who felt that was wrong because of the, uh, what they perceived as Charlie Hebdo's racist uh, and, and otherwise offensive viewpoints. We're not receiving any awards today, so I'm gonna say this. Awards are a PR thing. 
Okay, and unless I get one, which is <laughs> completely deserved. But no, you know, they're a PR award. And, you know, there's a PR aspect to it. You want people to come to your dinner, right? It's not the Olympics. The, 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 the bestest of the best doesn't necessarily get the award. So I understand Pen America wanting to give it to Charlie Hebdo. They clearly had played uh, a very prominent role in, in free expression. There it is. Um, and so the idea that the, the award was somehow offensive, I, I just don't go there. That, you know, are there people who would be more worthy of, of standing up and getting an award for standing up for, free, for the freedom of expression? Absolutely. A lot of people talk about um, a, a journalist in Azerbaijan um, and uh, who's now in, in prison. Her, her name is, is, is Kajia is, uh, is Mayalava. I almost got that right. And, you know, here's a person who's standing up to her government in ways that are unimaginable, investigating corruption in a state that is, is, is just incredibly corrupt. And they have arrested her for conspiracy to cause someone to commit suicide. Um, and to me, that's the great value of, of PEN America and PEN International has been to focus on government oppression of free speech. That's really, to me, kind of the, the, the heartland of free expression is, is when governments are using their power to abuse those who want to speak freely. And uh, uh, Kadia's case is really front and center. So those are, the kind of, th those are the kind of people I hope that we ultimately honor and award and talk about, but I, I certainly don't uh, uh, fault Penn for uh, deciding that Charlie Hebdo had become to symbolize free expression and, and would be a worthy honoree as well. Yeah, unfortunately, I agree with David here as well. <laughs> um, I don't think Penn was wrong to, to give the, the award to, to Charlie Hebdo, specifically because the award, and I'll repeat it, is called the Good Ale Freedom of Expression Courage Award. I mean, Penn was not giving Charlie Hebdo the we love your Mohammed cartoons, or you know, we, we agree with everything you say. Award. It was it was a, an award given for courage, and certainly the cartoonists that work for Charlie Hebdo are courageous in the sense that, in the face of of extremism, they were bombed in 2011 as well. They continued to to stand up for um, for free speech. Um, at the same time, though, I, I uh, also agree with David that Penn is known for defending imprisoned writers in the face of government impression, uh, oppression. And so the, the, this particular award was um, unusual in that respect uh, because it wasn't given uh, for that purpose. But related to David's point about um, the plight of free speakers in, in, um, in a, uh, under oppressive governments, I mean, I think it, this gets lost in the conversation sometimes too, but in many Muslim countries there are significant restrictions on, on free speech and many Muslims in those countries are suffering quite a bit. Uh, because of those of, of those restrictions. I mean, my home country in, of Turkey imprisons more journalists um, than any other country in the world, um, even ahead of, of Iran and, and China, which is um, which is quite quite concerning. Um, well, and, you know, to, related to that, it, it, I hate to do this, but we're gonna have to say a kind word about Gawker. Uh, one of the it had to happen. Uh, Gawker ran a picture of the lineup of um, governments that were represented at the, at the rally after Charlie Hebdo, the big, remember the big rally in Paris and, and President Hollande and everybody got in line there. And you look at that gallery of people there standing up for free expression, a representative of the government of Mali, a representative of the government of Egypt, a representative of the government of Turkey, a representative of that haven of free speech, Qatar. Uh, <laughs> You know, th that's why I say this wasn't about free expression. The, the, the records of those companies are deplorable. <laughs> they have done more damage uh, to, to free expression than anything that, 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 uh, that I could imagine in terms of as, no matter how terrible what happened to Charlie Hebdo was, which it was, but, you know, in, in the long run, over the course of history, it is government oppression that, that, that should be the target here. Uh, certainly, the the, the the lineup was sort of ho a hall of fame of or who's who of you know some of the most famous oppressors of speech in the world. Russian foreign minister was there. The Turkish prime minister was there. I think Jordan's king, King Abdullah II, was there as well. Uh, conspicuously, though, of course, there was no White House presence. Right. So President Obama did not attend. Secretary of State John Kerry did not attend. Although I believe we did send our ambassador to France uh, to to attend. What do you think about that? Was that a, a well, mistake? The, uh, I, I, 
I'm going to put on my New York Times hat and not, not take a political position on that. I would say this, though. Maybe, maybe they understood that Gawker was going to run that picture and have, you know, the, the Gawker picture shows all those guys and then has, like, it's all captioned by what they've done. And maybe they feared that if it was John Kerry, there would be a discussion of our reporter Jim Risen being threatened with prison for uh, having, for trying to protect a class, trying to protect a source who had given him information about the CIA. I don't know. Uh, if I remember correctly, the White House later said that uh, uh, they, they admitted essentially that they blundered and they said they should have sent someone more high profile to, to attend the funeral. Um, maybe at this point we can open things up to questions, if that's all right? Sure. Yeah. So um, We will now find out what the rest of the world thinks. Yeah, right? exactly. Okay. We've got about 15 minutes for questions. So the members of the City Club can approach the microphones, and when you do, please identify yourself as a City Club member. Um, and please try to keep your question to 30 seconds or less. Um, and those of you who are non-members of the City Club, you can ask questions as well, but please write your questions on an index card and hold it up high so the, the City Club staff can grab the, uh, the index cards from you. Go over here. Uh, Kurt Wavering, member. Um, Edward Snowden approached several newspapers, including uh, The Guardian and as the <clears throat> Washington Post. Um, I don't think he approached um, the New York Times, but that's one part of my question, I guess, is did he? And uh, what has been, uh, what's your opinion about what he did? Wow. Uh, <laughs> The, 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 I'll start with the simple stuff. Uh, he, he did not approach the New York Times. In fact, he's been quoted as saying that he uh, didn't like the fact the New York Times held for a long period of time. The initial story on warrantless wiretapping by the NSA, we, we ultimately published it, but uh, we had held the story for, for almost a year. Um, and he felt that uh, he wanted to go with someone who was uh, more likely to in his view, published robustly. In the end, we ended up working with The Guardian and um, have published Snowden stories based on the, on the Snowden documents. Um, from a legal standpoint, I feel very strongly that uh, we have the right to do that. Uh, I think we have handled it with remarkable responsibility. I think the stories have been important. And, and I understand people's concern that um, you know, should uh, important national secrets be, uh, whether they're published or not, be decided by uh, people who are essentially low-level employees like Edward Snowden? It's a tough question, but I, I certainly feel the way the Snowden leaks themselves have has unfolded that um, it's been a, a very, very valuable exercise, and I don't think you would see the debate that we are having this week in Washington over whether to extend the uh, massive collection of telephone data taking place had it not been for Snowden. And I think it's a debate worth having. Coraline Kraft, City Club member. This is really directed toward the man from Turkey whose name I can't recall. And if I had been able to spell Hagia Sophia, I would have written this question. Uh, thanks for explaining why the depiction of Prophet Muhammad is so reprehensible to Muslims. I did not know that, but I'm thinking about the Hagia Sophia when you have the representations of Christians and Muslim language and symbolism in the Hagia Sophia. Thing one, and this is sort of against the rules, but I'm gonna f fill the second question, and that is you alluded to the perhaps hypocrisy in France with them not allowing women to be veiled but when I was in Turkey, there was a decision that did not allow women to wear head coverings in business and in university. Yeah, both very good questions. So the Hagia Sophia, for those who don't know, it was a church uh, when Istanbul was Constantinople, to quote that they might be giant song. Um, when Istanbul was Constantinople, Hagia Sophia used to be a church, and then when the Ottomans took over in 1453, it was converted to a mosque, and now it's a museum. So if you go to Istanbul, this should definitely be on your list of places to visit. And you walk in, not only do you see Islamic calligraphy, but also um, images of, of Jesus Christ and, and the Virgin Mary as well, uh, side by side with each other. Now, that's an exception. I think most mosques around the world don't have any images um, in them. So Hagia Sophia is one notable exception, although Hagia Sophia is more of a museum now 
than a mosque where you can go in and, and pray. And, um, and also, there have been historically some Muslim artists who have depicted the Prophet Muhammad, uh, particularly within the Shi'i branch of, um, of, of Islam. So certainly there are exceptions, but, but I, I would say that the vast majority of the Muslim world considers the depiction of Prophet, uh, Prophet Muhammad to be blasphemous. And one of the other, and I'll just mention this as a side point too, that the Quran and Islamic law in general is quite ambiguous actually. We tend to have this conception that there is a singular Islamic law or singular Sharia law where you can pull a book off the shelf and sort of look up what, what it says. But just like other religious sects, the Quran is also vague and ambiguous. So there are multiple different conflicting schools of thought and different ways of interpreting the Quran. So two people can look at the same language and reach very different results. And with respect to the, to the restrictions on, on wearing Islamic clothing in, in Turkey, now coincidentally and interestingly, the Turkish version is of secularism, the word is laiklik, is based on the French version of secularism, laicite. It, the words are even very similar to each other. So Turkey, after its founding in 1923, established a fairly strictly secular top-down um, system where there were restrictions on the wearing of Islamic headscarves, not in public, but in universities, so in, in, in government buildings and the like, although those restrictions have since been, uh, been lifted as well. So Turkey is an interesting country in that regard, too. That's a topic for another day, but it's majority Muslim, yet has this really strictly secular um, legal system. Wynne Wakala, City Club member. Taking this down to a personal level, we've heard about kids in schools being bullied by what people put on the internet about them. And, you know, things on the internet are there forever. How do you draw the distinction between freedom of speech and, and harmful slander? I hope you're going to take that one. <laughs> oh, That's all you, David. You know, you, you're absolutely right. It's a really, it's a really, really tough issue. And I think in our system, that the answer is that it, it much of it, if not the overwhelming majority of it, needs to be allowed, um, and that we need to again have the kind of speech that responds to it and you know, attempts to, to offset it. But let me, let me come at it a different way, which is that I think when it, that, you know, we're not in a, a uh, legal system where speech can never be penalized. If you go out and commit fraud with words, you're still, you're going to be convicted for fraud. If you incite people to violence, incitement laws are permitted if it's, uh, uh, if there is really an imminent threat. Um, and so I think to some extent the bullying can be addressed through current law. But at the end of the day, I, and this is, is you know, both the great thing about America and the difficult thing about America, we just need people who are going to stand up as private citizens and, and push back on, on bullying. And that's really hard for kids. That's really hard for adults. But uh, in the end, that's the way our system works, and uh, it's, it's a cry for better readers and better internet users and better viewers. Greg McPherson, City Club member. Um, uh, my question is two parts. First, is it ethical for a journalistic organization to uh, publish information or, or uh, material that is deeply offensive to some populations if it cannot provide reasonable security to its staff who may suffer the consequences. Uh, and then my second part question is, is it ethical for a, um, a, a, a newspaper to, a Western newspaper to send uh, its journalists or to use the work of independent journalists into the area controlled by the so-called Islamic State where they will be at grave risk just for being there? Um, really tough issues. Um, the, the, the answer, at least in my mind, is that um, as with all of our employees, we have a responsibility to uh, keep them safe. There is going to be risk involved in everything we do um, in, in, in hostile zones, and we need to take whatever reasonable steps we can to protect people, and that includes freelancers. We're, the New York Times has been um, adamant that we will not use freelancers where we wouldn't use full-time people. If we use freelancers, we provide them with the same level of protection and care that we would for, um, for our full-time employees. As you know, um, freelance journalists were 
uh, really the victims of horrible things in, in, in Syria and with, with, with ISIS. Um, and it, it really was uh, incredibly sad to see. Uh, in, in my role at the New York Times, uh, I have been the crisis response manager for two kidnappings uh, and for the detention of four journalists in Libya, the death of a great journalist, Anthony Shadid, um, who, who died while in Syria, uh, and a variety of other things that um, are, are tough and sobering. And in, in two of those incidences, uh, in uh, Libya, uh, a driver, a local driver, a Libyan, was killed. And in Afghanistan, a wonderful, wonderful Afghan journalist who is working with us as a freelancer was killed during the rescue uh, that was attempted. And in both of those cases, we felt as an institution we had a responsibility to their families, just as we had a responsibility to them when they went out. Um, your question's really good, though, because with the economic pressures, a lot of organizations are relying on freelancers, and freelancers realize they get paid by doing dangerous things. And it's, it, I agree with you, it's not right uh, to put them in harm's way if you wouldn't do it with your own people. Before I go to the gentleman at, at the mic, perhaps I can read one index card question and then we'll, we'll continue um, with City Club members. So um, this card asks, the, the Times famously published the photos of controversial photographer Robert Maglethorpe, which deeply offended Christians. Uh, why treat the, the, the Charlie Hebdo cartoons differently? Oh, the, the consistency point's very hard. Um, and and, and, and you know, seriously, I think it's, it's very hard. It's you know, different decisions at different times. Um, I think that in the mix of things that the, that the, uh, the cartoons of the prophet uh, had been seen as deeply disturbing uh, in and of themselves without any redeeming value. You may feel the same way about photographs uh, depicting the Christian religion or Judaism in an offensive way. I think that, that in most of those cases, it's been seen as not gratuitous, that they were artworks or that they were uh, otherwise had some value. But tough questions and, and certainly uh, one of those things that is, is, is uh, you know, you, you put all the factors into play and, and you try to come out with the best possible decision. Do people need to see this to understand the story? Is there some redeeming value in them? What's the likelihood that people will be offended? Um, I, I'm, I'm sure that we don't always get it right. Walter Robinson II, City Club member. Um, so mine is a bit to piggyback off of a question earlier that talked about online and cyberbullying. How do you, as um, a journalistic organization, oh, am I, can you hear me now? Okay, there we go. Um, how do you, um, as a journalistic organization and with the change in the tools that are used, um, with commenting and the commenting trolls that are online as well. How do you hold your organization accountable for the comments that are left on the feeds, um, even though you kind of need that to drive uh, the digital media moving forward? Right, the, the New York Times uh, alone, I think, among most of the legacy media organizations and maybe other media, new more media organizations as well, um, actually screens comments before they're put up. And uh, obviously there is a uh, economic price one pays for that because I, the, the freer your site is for comments, the more people come and the, you know, there, there is a, a, a value in the marketplace for uh, being a host to outrageous things that people come to, to then respond in outrageous ways. Um, so, so I feel comfortable about the way we're doing that. Uh, we, they, they are screened, there are limitations to periods and so forth of how long you're, you're allowed to comment. But I, I will say this, two, two of our reporters became the object of a Twitter mob um, uh, at, for their reporting on what went on in Ferguson. And so the Ku Klux Klan, and speaking of a minority organization that Satra should punch down at, but the Ku Klux Klan and, and other uh, you know, right-wing types took after these two reporters, and it was 
absolutely shocking the things that people would say online that uh, from the veil of anonymity. It's not an argument against free speech, but I really understand, uh, you know, firsthand or secondhand, I guess, as it were, um, the just how how vicious uh, the anonymity of the internet can be. And uh, as much as I hope we get better readers, better viewers, better internet. Uh, users, it better come quickly because it's really bad out there a lot of the time. David Crandall, City Club member. Uh, I appreciate your strong comments about the importance of free speech and your emphasis has been on it as it relates to individuals. Uh, given that, I'd like you to help me understand the legal logic that led to the Citizens United decision where corporations who are now replacing our government as the primary influence in our lives are somehow individuals. Wow. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, um, I, I'm going to, uh, the, the, the New York Times actually has editorialized against the Supreme Court's decision, decision in Citizens United. Um, I think that most of the people I run around with in the free speech world think that, mm, uh, you know, that it, it, it follows from sort of basic First Amendment principles that uh, uh, that speech should be free and not regulated, especially political speech. Um, it's a, it's a. The, the, here's the difficulty: is that the what I consider the greatest First Amendment decision of all time was a corporate speech decision. It's Times versus Sullivan, okay? People don't think of it as corporate speech, but the defendant in that case was the New York Times company, a corporation that was, uh, and, and Justice Brennan, the Supreme Court, found that uh, we needed, and all newspapers and publishers needed greater protection against libel suits that are brought to shut us up. So drawing the line between who's a corporate speaker and who's an individual speaker is, is, is hard, but um, I'm happy to be able to, to mimic the New York Times editorial line here, which is that the decision wrongly allowed money to influence decisions. In my First Amendment hat, I can argue against that, but I'm not gonna sound schizophrenic today. I'll let you handle that. <laughs> we'll, we'll take another question. <laughs> Leslie Johnson, City Club member. I'm, I'm still wrestling with the notion of the decision to, to leave out part of the story in that situation. And I, I gather some of this is about the sort of the tension between freedom of religion and, and free speech, which you haven't talked about very specifically. But, but in that context of the, of the freedom of people, some people to speak in ways that offend other people on the basis of religion or the sense of safety. There was a, another kind of small story yesterday about the Midwest newspaper who published a letter to the editor that was a pretty explicit call to an uprising and violence against the president. And then their they, explanation was, sorry, our bad. We didn't notice the language in the letter. Um, how credible is their explanation, number one? And number two, would the New York Times have published a letter to the editor, an individual speech on that subject? If so, why or why not? I, and I don't know the particulars of the case, but I, I do think that that sort of thing would be seen as, as falling outside the standards we try to maintain. Um, it, it's. You know, it's, you make the point about whether the cartoons are were necessary to tell the story, and I, I think that's a legitimate question and a legitimate standpoint. I think it's especially true in terms of the second cartoon. How was Charlie Hebdo going to respond to what had just happened? Um, and in the end, you try to to find that that line. Um, I think again, it's it's are, is there some underlying value in that? in the presentation that is necessary for readers to see, will words do it, uh, or and is it something you need to, to see? This isn't really as responsive as uh, to the, that question as it might be, but interestingly enough, there was a cartoon that appeared in uh, the online version of the New York Times, uh, which uh, either shows the, uh, the leader of Turkey cutting up the Turkish flag or cutting up a piece of meat. There was a flag was imposed on the side of this uh, 
uh, uh, meat on, on a spittle. And you had to see it. And, and a guy who carried it, I should tell the whole story, a guy who was carrying that image in, in a protest in Istanbul ended up getting arrested. And you kind of had to see the cartoon to understand why there was a dispute about what it showed. Um, and I use that simply as an example that sometimes the image is part of the, is a necessary part of the story. We have run out of broadcast time for further questions and we'll have to stop for the day. As we close, please join me in offering our sincere thanks to David McCraw and Ozan Verrill. <laughs>